It's awesome to be back here at Velocity New York. Hopefully everybody feels the same. And um, you probably can't tell, but I'm wearing my uh, invisible Captain Obvious uniform this morning uh, because I wanted to tell you something. I wanted to tell you that the internet is everywhere. It's already in all of our pockets. It's making its way into our vehicles, our thermostats, um, and even onto our bodies. But more than that, more than just being ubiquitous, I would argue that it's also on its way to becoming foundational. What do I mean by that? I mean technology that is so pervasive and reliable that normal people don't even really know it's there. They, they just think it just works. Other people think, here's a fun idea. Let's try to build something fancier on top of that foundation. Challenge ourselves. So what are some examples of foundational technology, t technology that just work? Uh, well, forks, right? That's pretty solid tech right there. Um, and really, if your fork is giving you problems, then maybe you just need to learn how to use a fork. Um, wheels, pretty good. They've been around a bit. Um, utilities, electricity is not perfect, um, but it's pretty darn solid. We'll see some numbers in a minute. Phones, this kind, um, maybe, maybe it's there, maybe it's not quite there yet. This kind, definitely solid in its heyday, kind of on the boring side, though. Um, so what about the Internet? Can we put it in that just works category? I'm going to have to go with not so much. Uh, and you don't have to look hard to find examples of why, because every time it doesn't just work, the whole Internet freaks out, right? This was just in the last couple weeks. Or cloud goes down and there's major carnage. Catchpoint helping to watch over us all. They're talking about micro outages. And sometimes these outages are really serious, right? It's not just losing access to our social feeds and online shopping. Uh, it's real-world impact. Like, how about a nationwide coffee outage lasting an entire evening caused by a computer problem? And I think the best example or best illustration of how Internet falls into the doesn't just work category is the fact that we have sites like this. This just totally shows that people expect this stuff to fail often, and when it does, it's going to fail widely. Imagine if some of that older foundational technology had the same failure modes. We'd have people go into sites like this to try to figure out if everybody else's fork <laughs> was also currently not working. Um, but let's get serious for a moment and look at some numbers that hit close to home for us running a delivery network. If you look at end-user availability numbers for cloud and CDN providers, you find that even the best providers are in the range of two nines. And maybe it's the provider's fault, maybe sometimes it's the data center or the transit or the end user's ISP, but for the end user, it doesn't really matter. Their service isn't working. 99% comes out to about three days of total downtime in a year. Compare that to an electrical utility, and in North America, you're talking about four nines, uh, or 1.5 hours in a year. So this doesn't look great for the internet, right? But is it good enough? Um, Business is certainly booming. I would argue it probably has been good enough so far. It's gotten us to where we are. But I see us all here wanting to do more. We want to take our apps and turn them into foundational services, building blocks that other people can build fancier things on top of, which is awesome. That's great. But it also scares me because if the bottom layers are not 100% totally rock solid, then a failure anywhere in the stack can send the whole thing toppling over. It can crash into neighboring stacks and take those down, too. It could be massive cascading failure, which doesn't sound good when your entire society is running and sitting on top of those stacks. So why? Why is it that the Internet sits in this doesn't just work category? Uh, lots of ways to answer. We'll hear many of them at this conference, but I want to focus on two and talk about how we address these in our environment, which is this global delivery network. So let's talk about real-time dependencies. Um, any sophisticated technology is going to be the result of an assembly chain of many smaller and smaller subcomponents that come together. So if it's cars, you're talking about manufacturers for engines and wheels and differentials and paint and fabric. And by the way, I'm not sure if this is exactly the right way to build a car, so don't try that at home. Uh, if it's a web app, you're talking about service providers for cloud compute, uh, content delivery, third-party ads and analytics. Both sides here have deep dependency chains, but the difference 
is that for the web app, those dependencies are real time. So that if one of the links fails, the whole app could be down right now and for everyone. Whereas for a car, not all the components of a car are going to fail for all users all at the same time everywhere. If the carburetor manufacturing plant gets hit by a giant red X, then all the carburetors currently in production are going to keep chugging along just fine. So this is a challenge for the internet. How do we deal with this? Uh, one of the things we do is end-to-end -end audits. Uh, we find that we end up with a lot of systems that look like this, uh, look like a pipeline. This example is configuration changes propagating from our customers out to the edge network. And what we've learned is that there's many ways that this can fail. In fact, many more ways than we can even possibly think of. So rather than relying on individual tests to cover all the known failure modes, uh, we focus on end-to-end -end audits that cover the whole thing. So in this case, uh, it might be that we act exactly as a customer would, and we inject a config change over here on one end of the pipeline. Say we're going to add a response header that uh, carries some unique value. And then we pull for the results all the way on the other end of the pipeline. Check that we see that expected header. So if anything in the middle fails, we'll notice. And we've got the whole thing covered. Uh, another approach we take is strong fail-safe behavior. So again, edge server is sitting at the end of this long chain of dependencies. And each step in that chain has the ability to transform the data in some way, which means it also has the ability to corrupt the data in some way. Say if there's a bug in the code, or if there's a bug in the user that enters the data that we didn't catch with input validation. So we put super strong, maximum paranoid level safety checks around the edge server so that if there's anything amiss in the configuration data that's coming in, it will just totally reject it, go into fail-safe mode, and keep running with its old config. Now, that old config might be a little bit stale, but it turns out that stale and up is way better than fresh and down. OK, so let's move on to complexity. And for inspiration, we can look at the most complex thing of all, which is life. So here's a quote about life. The edge of chaos is where life has enough stability to sustain itself and enough creativity to deserve the name of life. It is the constantly shifting battle zone between stagnation and anarchy, the one place where a complex system can be spontaneous, adaptive, and alive. So does that resonate with anyone as an analogy with your experience working in technology? On the one hand, it sounds pretty awesome, right, that last part? On the other hand, you are battling with anarchy. Uh, which I believe is the main theme of the operations track here at Velocity tomorrow afternoon, so go check that out. Um, but what does this battle look like? Well, did you ever have to deploy to production when your automated tests weren't exactly the right color? Or did you ever have a graph of number of critical errors in some production system, and the scale of the y-axis in that graph had way more orders of magnitude than appropriate for a graph of critical errors? So... Technology and life, both sitting at the edge of chaos. What can we learn from life? Uh, one thing is homeostasis. This is multiple feedback systems working together to keep some parameter within a desired range. For instance, mammals uh, keeping their blood temperature at a fixed point. Uh, we try to do the same. Our edge servers try to take care of themselves. For instance, they manage their own disk usage. Uh, they rotate their logs, and they purge old content out of cache. But sometimes those gentle mechanisms fail. And we need something more aggressive. And so we built a system called Crayfish, which has this awesome logo that you can see right here. And here's how it works. It's a central engine that watches over a fleet of servers, uh, looks for parameters that are out of range, consults a database of actions that it knows it can try, checks to see if those actions are safe under the current conditions. And if so, it goes ahead and runs those actions and restores the system to happy health. Now, another thing that life has is plasticity, which gives it the ability to change and allows it to degrade fairly gracefully. So, for instance, here are some illustrations of the brains of stroke patients that are literally rewiring themselves during rehabilitation. So here's plasticity in our environment. Our service includes hierarchical caching, which means that if there's a cache miss at an edge pop, the request gets routed then to a shield pop, which offloads traffic from customer's origin. And we have multiple redundant transit providers connecting these pops, so that, in theory, if one transit has an outage, BGP should help us route around the problem like this. In practice, it's different than in theory, and this doesn't always work in a timely way. So we built a plasticity system that we call Wahoo, which gives the application the choice and the control over request routing in a bi-directional way. 
So the edge server sitting over there can send its request over the default route. If that fails for some reason, the application has the control and the decision to send that request to retry it over an alternate route and get a happy response. So in summary, is the internet reliable yet? We're working on it. I think we're all working on it here. So that's my time. I want to thank these fine people for their help with this talk. Uh, here's where you can find us online. And a little pitch, if you want to hear a great story about the people side of technology change, please come see my colleague Daniel Lockhart's talk tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much.